So every once in a while, people cross your paths. Um, I think my path was crossed in, uh, what did you say, late, mid to late 80s, right? Uh, this guy shows up at Calvary Temple, he becomes the youth pastor. At that time, I was just sort of on the fringe, I was on the outside, but there are some of you here who grew up and who were uh, a product of our guest ministry here, uh, what was uh, known as Potter's House, right? Was it, did, is that what you called it? Is that what you changed it? No, you didn't, it was already changed by the time you got in there, okay. So Brent was uh, at Calvary Temple for roughly three years. He was also uh, a pastor at Christian Life Assembly in Langley for 28 years, and currently... He is now, uh, I would say, a world evangelist would be the best way to do it. A heart for uh, getting the gospel, the message out to people across the world. You've traveled the world. You have a heart for Canada like no other. He sits on the lead team of ARC. ARC is the Association of Related Churches, of which our church is a partner of. And it's a church planting organization. And we sponsor currently uh, John Ozantig. We oversee and we're giving a uh, uh, blessing to him as he has planted his church in Edmonton. His first Sunday was well over 300 people and he's solid and moving. And uh, we're, we stand behind him and we're a part of this network that's right across North America. And Brent sits on the lead team of, uh, of the Canadian division. Brent's also my brother's best friend. So I don't know what you tell him about me, which scares me half the time, but it's, it, no, I'm sure you do. Don't, don't even go there with me. But uh, it's, it's like I said, it's interesting how paths cross because there's just an affinity for our family, for Brent and his family and his ministry. And uh, it's a pl- privilege and a pleasure to have him here. You've been here a couple times. Uh, you're here with the story of the stars and just uh, traveling through as well. And again, I just want to turn over the stage to Brent. I would like you to make him feel comfortable and welcome and uh, give him your undivided attention. Will you please? Thanks for coming. Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning. So good to be back in Winnipeg and with Pastor Jerry and Sharon and the whole team. It's always, always a great joy. Uh, this city has a, a big place in our lives and our hearts, and uh, I'll talk about that in just a second. I just want to say thank you on behalf of church planting in Canada. Um, there aren't very many Jerry and Sharon Michalskis in the world who can just sort of decide we're going to do something and then make it happen to the glory of God. But there are all kinds of young men and women who have a heart to plant churches, and they just need somebody to come along beside them and help them to see it accomplished. So that's what the ARC is, Association of Related Churches. And uh, we're committed to seeing churches planted and still be going five years down the road, self-sufficient, supporting, going forward, growing. So because of your partnership with ARC this fall, Uh, We have seen three new church plants. Pastor Jerry told you about the one in Edmonton. Very exciting. Launch day, over 300 people. Uh, I I can't remember the number of people that received Christ that day, but I I think it was like a dozen or something like that. It was a good number. Seven? And uh, then we also, uh, a few weeks ago, there was a church launched in Surrey. Their opening Sunday, they had uh, 254 in attendance. Uh, And uh, two weeks ago, there was a church launched in North Vancouver, which is one of the most challenging neighborhoods in Canada. And on launch Sunday, they had 154 people in a church that was running about six. So uh, very, very exciting. And on that Sunday, I was there. There were 17 people who responded to the invitation Uh, to receive Christ. So you're a part of that across Canada. So go ahead and give yourself a round of happy and enthusiastic applause. Not just polite applause. Don't be Canadian about this. So thank you for that. I'm on the lead team uh, and uh, we're just excited about doing this work all across Canada. So when I was uh, a little boy, first of all, I can't really get started here and my time's going, but uh, I, I just want to say hello from my wife, Karina. Uh, we came to Winnipeg uh, when our oldest son was two weeks old. We'd been married two years, 
and Benny was just two weeks old. We moved to Winnipeg. Uh, we took a crappy apartment down in St. Vital somewhere and uh, struggled through our first winter. We didn't know what had hit us. And uh, so we have some deep, deep emotional connections to this city. And, um, uh, but she sends her love and her greetings. Uh, she's back in Langley. We have 11 grandkids, so it's highly unusual if she's not babysitting today. Uh, and uh, we just thank God. So her love and greetings to some of you would know her. But when I was a, a little guy, four years old, uh, my dad uh, had a TV show. It was based out of Red Deer, Alberta. It was one of the early... There's a Red Deer person here, okay. Uh, it was one of the earliest gospel TV shows in Canada. And uh, so what they would do is, is they would go to different, you know, towns and communities all throughout Alberta of people that watched the show, and they'd have television rallies. Uh, so I'm, I'm four years old, um, and, you know, my mother would say, as Moses' mother said of him, that I was a beautiful child. Uh, <clears throat> you can make up your own image, but at that point I had a lot of beautiful red hair. It really was. It was stunning. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, now things have changed, I know. But I would stand up on a chair, little four-year-old, freckle-faced, beautiful child, red hair, and I would sing songs. I would sing beautiful songs. And it was great, and people, you know, it was cute, it was a novelty, but the, the neat thing was, after I would sing these beautiful songs, people would give me money. And old ladies in particular, you know, they put money, oh, well, you're so cute, you know, and then they give you money. So, like, I would have a pocket full of money after these deals at four years of age. So, four years, you're thinking mostly about candy and you know, maybe buying a bike or something like that. So after this happened a few times, one day my dad took me aside. I'm four years old. And said, son, I'm going to teach you the principle of tithing. <laughs> I'm like, like a four-year-old. It's like, what in the world is that? So he took me aside with pennies and quarters and, and uh, taught me that one of every... Ten pennies belongs to God, and one of every ten dollars belongs to God, and ten of every one hundred dollars is God's. So at four years of age, I learned about tithing. I wasn't that happy about it, actually. <laughs> Some of you still feel that way. You haven't gotten free yet. I have a, one grandson's name, uh, whatever his name is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I hate that. It's Hudson. There it is. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and uh, Hudson has somehow decided that he doesn't want gifts anymore. He says to me, uh, Papa, do you think on my birthday, instead of a gift, I could just have cash? And he calls it cash. It's the cutest thing. And he comes over and he wants to do chores. Uh, f to get paid, and so, and he refer he doesn't, so I give him coins, and he's like, Papa, do you think if I gave you this many of these coins that I could get a blue one? It's a five dollar bill, right? It's a, a blue one. He doesn't like the coins, he wants the bills, and so then he knows the purple ones, and he knows the green ones, and uh, the other day he said to me, he said, Papa, I traded five green ones for a brown one, so uh, he, <laughs> he has a bank account, and uh, I don't know whether, I'm, I'm going to check if they're teaching that boy about tithing, but I'm thinking he's going to be an entrepreneur. He's going to look after me when I'm old. I'm excited about this. So uh, later on, when I was in grade six, I went to Laura Secord Elementary School, and then I went to grade seven at Gordon Bell uh, Secondary School, and I had a paper route here in Winnipeg in grade six and seven. My parents were masochists, they were cruel people, and uh, they made me have a paper route in this city. And uh, so you know that I walked through mountainous snow drifts in blizzards. And my paper drop was on Portage Avenue. 
And uh, I don't know, they seem to always be late. There, there was one time I was so cold. I want sympathy at this point. So at some point you can start to say, aww, okay? Some point I was so cold one day in my paper route that I was crying. I know. And I knocked on a kind lady's door and I, I said, I'm going to go so fast, so cold. Can I use your phone? So I phoned my dad and my dad came and picked me up in the car and we finished the route that day. So I have a lot of emotional attachments to this city. <laughs> but I made money as a paper boy. And one day I laid it all out on the bed and I was rolling in it, literally. <laughs> and my dad walked in. He said, what are you doing? I must have heard the phrase rolling in dough, right? So I said, I'm rolling in dough. And so... He said, okay, let's, let's go back to the lesson. And he taught me all over again about tithes and about offerings and honoring God. So that's how I've been raised. For many of you, that's, that's not how you've been raised. Your perspective on money uh, wasn't like that. But I just want, as I start this message on giving and generosity and tithing, I want to say that I've lived my whole life this way my wife and I and our family, and my father and his family, they've lived their lives, and their fathers have lived their lives this way. None of us are wealthy. That wasn't God's call on our life, but God has provided for us in supernatural ways, consistently, miraculously, ways that we would never have imagined because through our whole lives, we have had the biblical perspective that we are not in this financial journey by ourselves that we are in a partnership with the God who has the ability to provide in any circumstance in his own way, in ways that surprise us. Just, just it's, it's a little thing. Just two weeks ago, I was at this event, and the lady came up to me. She said, I need your email address. I gave her my email. I didn't know what she wanted. I gave her my email address. She said, 11 years ago, you did a wedding, and we forgot to give you an honorarium. <laughs> And uh, I had forgotten too. But that, I was just, I said, Lord, that's just a crazy thing that somebody would remember and pay something that they felt from 11 years ago. And so I was able to say, thank you, Lord. It's a blessing. And I, I gave most of it to my kids, you know, because they're always in need. But um, <laughs> So I'm here today, and I, I really want to be a blessing to you. I hope the church is blessed, but I, I want to be a blessing to you. This topic is one that you think about every day. You probably don't think about a lot of spiritual things every day, but you think about money every day. You would be very unusual if you don't. This is a huge part of our lives, and to not address it from a spiritual perspective is, is just wrong. A lot of people in the church have been burned, there have been bad examples, there have been all kinds of things, and a lot of it becomes an excuse for us to just keep the money. The Bible talks about finances and provision and miracles a lot. Jesus talks about money a ton, as do the other apostles in their writings. So, but, but my heart is, is not, I'm not on commission today, just want you to know. Uh, I don't get a cut. Uh, I, I, there's not, I, I don't want your money. And in fact, God doesn't want your money. He's fine, just in case you know. Like if you think that giving is God needing your money, he's really doing well globally. Things are good. The annual report is just fantastic. It's in the black. It's not about me getting your money, him getting this, getting your money. It's about you and God in a supernatural partnership in one of the most important and most uppermost things in your life and your mind. It's your finances. So I want to try and teach a little bit. I want to try and encourage you a little bit. And, uh, and hopefully at the end of it, your faith is going to be increased. I want to tell you a few stories. Uh, so if you start, you know, Losing it, just hang on, I'll get to a story and, and you'll, you'll like that. Let me just give a quick disclaimer before I go any further. Um, if you get out your mobile phone while I'm preaching and you check on the worldwide interweb 
And C, I know it's not that to the young people in the room. I know I'm old, but I know it's not the interweb. Anyway, uh, if you check tithing, giving, generosity, you will find a ton of loud and angry voices that will disagree with just about everything that I'm going to say. Now, that doesn't prove anything because they would also disagree with me on the means of salvation. They would disagree with us on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, on divine healing, on prophecy, on the role of women in ministry. They would disagree on all kinds of things because in the body of Christ, there are different streams and particularly different biblically in biblical interpretive streams who say the supernatural has ended, who say this about the Old Testament or this about the New Testament, that there's only this much of the New Testament that applies to the church. And so you need to know this is your family. This is your house. And this is where we are and how we interpret the scripture. So let me just give you a little bit of our interpretive point of view when it comes to the Bible. Because if you don't have the same starting point, then you'll, you'll never meet. And some of you may have come from different backgrounds and different traditions. Let, let me just describe to you how we come to the positions that I'm going to share with you in a moment. As spirit-filled believers, we are those who believe that all the teachings of Jesus apply to today. There are streams of the body of Christ who will tell you that the teachings of Jesus do not apply to the church. But we believe that everything that Jesus said to his church applies to his church today. We believe that the examples of Luke and Acts apply to today. We believe that the teaching of the apostles and the first disciples and everything that they experienced should be experienced in our lives today. We do not divide the New Testament into specific dispensations. We accept the authoritative teachings of Jesus as the head of his church. We also accept Luke, John, James, Peter as valid theologians in addition and in complement with the teachings of Paul. There are streams that say the teachings of Paul are the didactic for the church and its doctrines. We're not those people. We say that the whole of the New Testament is valid and has application to the church today. And on the subject of money and generosity, we use the whole of the New Testament, not just isolated parts that are from one particular author. And something also that you have to understand about us is how we use the Old Testament. We use the Old Testament to impact our lives as the New Testament writers use the Old Testament. The New Testament writers referred to the Old Testament as authoritative. They used the Old Testament for teaching, for wisdom. And the things that were done away with are clear, but the things that were retained are also clear. I don't know if you know, but the New Testament authors in just about every book of the New Testament reference the Old Testament. There are between eight and 900 Old Testament references in the New Testament writings. So that's how we use the Old Testament. We reference it. We don't apply everything as it was applied in those days, but we take the wisdom, we take the experience, and we take principles that are timeless and apply them and implement them into our lives. So just so you know that how we approach the scripture definitely impacts the topic today when it comes to our finances and money. Okay, so let me give you the goal of this message. It is that every person in this church, in this room, would experience the supernatural power of God in your finances. So whether you're 15 years old or 50 or 150, the goal is that you in your life would experience the supernatural power of God in your finances. Secondly, that you would live with confidence that God is your provider, not your employer, not your pension plan, not the stock market, not Bitcoin, but that God is your provider. Thirdly, that you would have no fear of losing your money or that money would not have control over you. 
So those three things, first of all, that you would experience the supernatural power of God in your finances, that you'd live with confidence that God is your source, and thirdly, that you would be free of the fear and the control of money in your life. Okay, first principle. Giving and generosity are spiritual. Giving and generosity are spiritual actions. Most of us think that worship is spiritual, prayer is spiritual, reading the Bible is spiritual, sharing our faith is spiritual, repentance is spiritual, salvation is spiritual. But let me just say that giving and money and those principles are spiritual principles that unlock the blessing of God on our lives. I want to say to you today, you will not grow spiritually. You will not grow spiritually if you have not come to peace and to faith when it comes to God and money. I believe some of you, this area is what is locking you up in your growth in God. I had a guy say to me one time, he said, Pastor, the day that I started to tithe, I was able to quit smoking. And I've been trying for years. Something was unlocked when I let and released the money into God's hands. Jesus says this, Luke chapter 16. No man, no woman can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. It's impossible to have two gods. I believe that money is the primary god of Canada. Money and self, those are the two big ones in Canada. Jesus says you cannot serve both God and money because both demand supremacy in our lives. First Timothy says, chapter 6, verse 10, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Money itself is not a root of evil, but the love of money or the elevation of money to the place of a God in our lives is the root of all evil. You just have to think about it for a minute. Most marriages that break up, there are money issues. Most of the crime in your city are related to money. All of the, the global frauds, the Ponzi schemes, the devastation of people's lives, sex trafficking. I mean, you just, it's all, it all boils down to the money. It is an evil thing when there is the love of money. I want to say, and I believe this is a pretty bold statement, but I want to say it. I hope you'll hear it. Completely surrendering to God's ways with money will result in spiritual breakthrough in your life. It will. Something's going to shift when you surrender to God's way. So firstly, giving and generosity are spiritual actions. Secondly, the earth is the Lord's. Everything is God's. Psalm 24 verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all its people belong to him. That means that everything here is his. Winnipeg is his. The Jets are his. We're all hoping for the Jets. I, I'm in such a bad place when it comes to the NHL right now. I mean, the Vancouver Canucks. I mean, what can you say? I mean, at least we've got this young kid. He's 19 year old. And like, you've got to believe that every person in Vancouver is talking about that kid. You know? And I know he got bashed into the boards last night. So I cheer for the Jets. I cheer for the Oilers. I think McDavid's fun. I cheer. What? I cheer for the Predators. My son lives in Nashville, so I cheer for the Predators. I, so, I, you know, I'm a bit of a... But today, I cheer for the Jets. I love the Jets. They're, praise God for the Jets all the way to the Stanley Cup. It's incredible what a team they are. But he owns them. He owns the cattle. He owns the wheat. He owns your tractor. He owns your car. It's his. Everything in this planet is his, and everything that you have is a trust from him to Stuart. He's lending it to you. He's lending you the air that you breathe, the gravity that keeps you from floating away. He's, he's lending that to you. That's my gravity. You can use it for a while. I might take it away one day. <laughs> the earth is the Lord's. So many people don't see that perspective. They think this is all my stuff, my money. My house, my, my, my future, my decisions, my investments, it's mine. A biblical perspective says, no, the earth is the Lord's. 
Everything is his, and all that we have is a gift from him. So giving and generosity are spiritual actions. The earth belongs to God. Thirdly, everything we have is a blessing from him, a gift from God. We are stewards of God's resources. It's not my job, my career, my business. They are a blessing from God. And he is the one, if you prosper, as you prosper, he's the one who teaches you how to prosper. Isaiah 48, verse 17, thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, I am the Lord, your God, who teaches you to prosper, who leads you by the way you should go. I want to say to you, God is not against you prospering. He is for you prospering. Can anybody say amen to that? Think you're afraid, aren't you? What is that, a faith teaching? I don't know, if should I say that? Amen. God is for you. He wants to bless you. That's his heart. I know about this. I'm a grandfather. I want to bless my grandkids. My kids, not so much. I've had it with them. <laughs> Seriously, you're married. You're like 30 years old. Come on. But my grandkids... Every, I was just, I don't know where I was. I was, I was in Los Angeles and I was in this mall and there were these little girls clothes. Like they were like unbelievable. I just stood in the window. I'm, it's pathetic, right? This old guy standing in the window of this little girl clothing shop just going, that is so adorable. <laughs> pathetic. I wanted to buy, but like the dress was $400. So I didn't buy it. But I understood you know, and then I've, I can't buy one because I've got like a zillion little girls. So uh, you don't do anything. But I know that feeling. I want to bless them. That's how God feels about you. He doesn't want to keep it from you. He wants to get it to you with the proviso that it will go through you. But that's where the problem is for many of us. We're like, yeah, I'll take that. And it stops. It's a cul-de-sac. That's never God's heart. His heart is to bless you. Everything we have, he teaches you how to prosper. Think back to the children of Israel when they left Egypt. And God said, I'm going to feed you every day the manna. And they didn't believe him, so they went out and they gathered more than they were supposed to. It bred worms and it stank. And then they were upset, like, why do we, you know, what's this all about? The point was God wanted to be their provider. He said, I'll take care of you every single day, every morning. It'll be there. I'll look after you. I'll be your provider. We'll be a partnership. We'll have a relationship. We'll be in this together. And that's God's heart for you when it comes to your finances. But most of us, once we get out of a jam, we usually look up at God and go, thanks so much. I'll take it from here. And then we do our own thing. God wants a partnership with you so that he can trust you to bless you knowing that your heart is to reflect his heart when it comes to your finances. So we want to take a minute now and just encourage you that God has a specific way that he has instructed us. God's way is to trust us with the true riches of heaven. I want to give you a scripture. I think this is one of the most powerful scriptures in all of the Bible about your finances. It's found in Luke chapter 16. And, and in this scripture, God is saying, I want you to have these blessings. I want to trust you with great blessing. And I want you to trust me and honor me. So let's look at this verse in Luke 16, verse 10. If you are faithful in little things, you'll be faithful in large ones. If you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibility. If you are untrustworthy, now listen, look at this, folks. If you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? God's heart is to trust you with the true riches of heaven. I was at a, a businessman's leadership event yesterday in Langley, where I live, and a very, very uh, successful businessman, his name's Alan Skidmore, 
He and his family owned what was called TransCanada Glass, became Speedy Auto Glass, Apple Auto Glass, uh, the, all the wireless wave cell phone stores that are in the malls. They had at one point 1,250 wireless wave stores plus all, and they were international in the U.S., everything. The guy's a, like a gazillionaire. And he was telling his story and sharing his testimony. And at one point he said, you know, I was in the hospital and I realized that I was on top of the world. I could buy anything, I had everything I wanted. Top of the world, everybody thought. And he said, there I am in the hospital sick. You can't buy your health. You can't buy peace. You can't buy family relationships. And everybody knows that, but most of you think, well, you know, I think I'll give it a shot. You know, give me a try at having all of the worldly wealth. I, I think I'll balance it really well. You know, some of these other guys, I don't know, they don't get it, but I'd like a shot at it, you know. That's just how we think. The reality is that God has riches for you that are called the riches of heaven. Now, I want you to catch this. Jesus is actually saying, if I can't trust you with the small stuff, the money. If I can't see your obedience when it comes to this little area of your life, how could I trust you with the greater riches of heaven, which are influence, which are peace, which are joy, which are love, which are relationships, which are all of the goodness that God wants to pour into your life. He's saying, if you're not going to trust me in this area and follow my ways, how is it that you could expect the blessings that are greater that should be in your life? I can say to you today, I mean, I wish I had more money. I'm just like you. I'd like to pay off my mortgage. I'd like to go to Hawaii. I'd like to, you know, I'd like to well, I'll stop there because, you know, like, I'm, don't get me started. But I know that if I had more money, it couldn't replace my family, couldn't replace my health, couldn't replace the work in the kingdom of God. I know that. The true riches of heaven is what God wants, which is a blessed life, not just a blessed bank account. And God is saying, but I've got to see just a little something to know that I can bless you with these true riches of heaven. It's a pretty sobering thought. Jesus is saying, if you're not trustworthy with worldly wealth, then it's possible that you'll also remain spiritually poor. It's power. It's Jesus. If we're obedient in our walk with God, we will grow in God. This, this particular passage in Luke chapter 16 is followed immediately by Jesus saying, you can't serve two masters. That's the context. They're right together in that passage. In Luke 16, he says that you can't serve two masters. The next verse after you can't serve two masters verse is verse 14. Luke 16, 14. And Jesus, or Luke commentates, he says, And the Pharisees, who dearly loved their money, heard all of this and scoffed at him. Isn't it interesting? that those who loved their money missed it on you can't serve God and money, missed it on you'll get the true riches of heaven, missed it on everything Jesus was saying. They scoffed at him. Their love of money scoffed at Jesus' message on how to be rich in the kingdom of God. I hope that there's nobody here like that. So three things. Generosity is spiritual. The earth is the Lord's. He owns everything. We are custodians, stewards of what he's given to us. And third, everything we have is a blessing and a trust from God. So I want to just ask you, you don't have to answer out loud. Do you want to experience the miraculous in your finances? Yeah, there's a few even bold enough to say yes. I do. I'm just not smart enough. I met with these business guys the other day. Some of you guys are going to love this. I met with these business guys, and they're talking all these things. You know, they're talking about cap space, cap rates, and all this stuff. You guys are laughing at me now. I know, business guys. But they're using these terms. I was two business guys. They're both really, really successful. And at one point, the one guy turned to me and said, Oh, 
pastor, uh, this means da 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 da, and you just sort of, didn't, you know, my, my eyes are sort of glazed over anyway because they're talking about all these big numbers. The thing is, the supernatural works in your finances when you submit it to God. Second question is, do you want to live in the confidence that God is your provider, that your God is more than enough? You're not in it by yourself. Thirdly, do you want to live free from the fear of losing your money? I've met some very, very wealthy people who live almost daily with anxiety that they're going to lose what they have and that they won't have enough left. And somebody here, that's you. And yet, God has said, I'll, I'll take care of it. So, let me give you the first testimony here. Let me give you the first story. I've got three or four stories of people that we walked with uh, together through their financial journey. I, I just want to say that I know that in this room there are uh, some people and, and you haven't started giving at all or just every now and then if you've got a, you know, a blue one in your pocket, you'll throw it in the bag or the joy basket. Uh, a blue one's a five, by the way, in case you forgot that. Um, and some of you have been a long time on the journey. Some of you are really feeling that you are called. I, there's probably some people in this room, and God has called you to make a lot of money. It's your calling in life for the purpose of blessing and expanding the kingdom of God. I've met some people like that. I met this guy just the other day, and he's he's very, very successful, and he said, I would say he's in his early 40s, he said, Pastor, I'm at the place now where I can just live on what I have, and I actually have more than I need, and for the rest of my life, I'm just going to give away everything I make. He's absolutely committed to that vision. So there's people in this room from all different parts of the spectrum, okay? So I got a few stories that I think you'll enjoy. Uh, in our church, they always called me PB, Pastor Brent, so... Here's this email. PB, Lisa and I agree with and practice the principles that you've been speaking on, and we wanted to tell you some of our story and testimony of blessings related to faith and finances. It has been a journey and at times quite difficult to stick to what we know is right with regard to finances, but we have always stuck to it regardless, from our tithes and offerings to the principles of blessed to be a blessing. We have learned to trust God and provide to provide and not others. With being faithful in all this, God has provided in miraculous ways, like making one income go as far as two, and we have numerous stories of blessings. As you know, I have a trade, he's a mechanic, I have a trade that allows me to do some extra work on the side. I have always said that God can bless me more than the person I am helping, so I only take payment for the materials used. I bless people with free labor, even though we could always use a little extra money. In doing this, I have always said I am banking blessings with God, whatever they may be. At one point, we were trying to rework our finances, and we knew we had to break a car lease to bring our budget back on track and get into a used car with no payments. It was almost a year. See, this isn't like, you know, like a debit machine. This is a relationship that is a lifetime. And that's very important, because some of you are going to think, oh, okay, I'm just going to do this today, and bada-bing, you know. Uh, it's a magic wand and everything's fine. No, it's about learning the relationship of trust, God's timing, God's just enough in just time. So here he says, it was a year of giving and praying and struggling and paying and being faithful before we received our blessing. It says, one day we were moving furniture to clean a downstairs spare room and we found 46 $100 bills under the bed. That's 46 brown ones, everybody. It was an unused room. There was no explanation as to where the money had come from, and we did search, like they contacted people who'd stayed there. We immediately gave a tithe and offering on it and then got out of our lease. We bought a used car and had it a year and a half when another blessing came along. I'd been thinking it was about the right time to replace, the car, uh, uh, replace that car, but we knew we couldn't afford to. I was sure we'd look for a newer car, so we went window shopping to see what was available and at what price. One week later, we had an unsaved family member purchase a two-year-old vehicle for us. My purpose in sharing all this is to give a current example of how big God is. 
That being said, we also have a huge part in this. God has tested us to see if we will stick to what we know is right. He has asked us to cut back in many areas, and we have made the choice not to let finances control us. We put every purchase through a filter. Is it a need? Is it a want? Or is it a need that can wait? In so doing, we control money, and money does not control us. And then he preaches a little bit. That's okay. He says, if someone eats desserts and not a balanced meal, it is unhealthy. I don't want the church to all go home and start looking under their mattress. That's good counsel, by the way. Some of you are going to try it. <laughs> but he says, God can do the big and awesome things anytime he sees fit. But I think the majority would need to know more of what's involved before you get to the des dessert. It has been years of testing and believing and not seeing, asking and feeling like no answers at times, giving when we've been in need ourselves, and simply letting God take responsibility on our part. It's a lifestyle and a perspective that has even been hard at times to explain. It's not a formula other than love on people and bless people when opportunity arises and give knowing I will never lack. That's a good story. You can give some applause for that story. 46 brown ones under the mattress, a new car, and a faithful lifestyle of honoring God. Let me just take quickly, and I'm going to move really quickly through this, but for a lot of people, there's misunderstandings and questions about the specifics. Let me talk specifically about the tithe for a few moments. We believe in tithes and offerings. Let me start with a scripture, and I, I don't have this one on the screen. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6. He who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly of necessity. God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency... This is really significant, that you have sufficiency enough in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Out of that scripture is the idea of how much is enough. How much is enough? That's what my friend was telling me. He's saying, I have enough, and I'm going to give the way the rest. His sufficiency is here, and the abundance he's going to use for kingdom work in God's word work. The New Testament standard is way beyond a 10% tithe. The New Testament standard is to grapple with the question of how much is enough. Generosity, if generosity doesn't reach up to at least 10%, then, then it's not generosity at all. And the standard is the extravagance of God's generosity in our lives. So a tithe, and most people need a starting point. A tithe is a starting point of learning to trust God and learning how to believe that he's able to provide. And for many of you, you have to start somewhere. And it's, it can be incremental, but just make it consistent and accurate. Whenever I say to make your tithe accurate, some, some people push back and they say, well, that seems really legalistic. Really, is it legalistic? Every time you deposit your check and you know to the penny how much it is, you know what's there. So be accurate. A tithe is 10%. Just don't, don't fiddle with it. A tithe isn't anything you decide to give. Now, if you can't go all the way to 10%, I'll read a story about a lady and that's where she was at, then start at 2%, but make it incremental. Every year increase it and watch God perform miracles in your life. Tithing is part of the New Testament teaching about money. It's not the whole teaching. In fact, it's not the major emphasis. But tithing is an invaluable starting point. I, I like to call it a, 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 a tutor, a foundation that teaches you the principles of partnership with God. A tutor. It's like school learning. Tithing is a timeless spiritual principle that preceded the law was not a part of the Mosaic Law. It's mentioned in the New Testament, has nothing to do with works towards salvation, neither is it legalism to practice tithing. Tithing is a tutor or a gateway that leads to a lifestyle of generosity. And it is one of the most practical ways you will experience God at work in your life. So let me tell you why tithe. 
Biblically, it is sound as a beginning point. It started with Abraham and Jacob. All throughout the Bible, it talks of first fruits, the first and the best belonging to God, not the dregs, not the last, not whatever is left over. Jesus endorsed the principle of the tithe along with justice and mercy. Jesus didn't remove the tithe even in condemning the legalism of the Pharisees. He left it intact. Matthew 23, Jesus speaking to the Pharisees said, you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. New Living Translation says, you should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. So Jesus doesn't remove it. Jesus commends giving from those who have very little. This is also a big issue. People on the outside say, why are you telling poor people to give? Well, look at what Jesus did. He goes to the temple and he sits beside the joy basket and watches what everybody puts in. And a very poor person came, a widow, and she gave the last two coins that she had and put them in the basket. And Jesus commends her and says, everywhere that the kingdom goes, this woman will be talked about. Now, why was he commending a poor woman for giving away the last money that she had? He was commending her trust in God. He was commending the fact that she had the perspective that God was going to provide for her. Here comes back to the point. If you don't have a, much money, then give what you are able out of what you have and partner with God. Don't just hang on to it and expect that it'll take care of itself. Let God into your process to bless and prosper you. And then those who have a lot of money, Jesus was a little harder on those with a lot of money. And he says to those in the same passage, they gave a tiny part of their surplus, but she poor as she was gave everything she had. Jesus was commending the spirit of giving. There is no New Testament teaching that specifically removes tithing, circumcision, the dietary laws, other things are addressed, but it's left intact. The assumption by the apostles, they would all have been present when Jesus said these things. It was the assumption of the first century church. That's how they were raised. That's how they lived. When the believers brought their offerings, they brought them to the local church. They laid it at the apostles' feet. They trusted the apostles with the distribution of the money. Another principle of the tithe is that you release it without strings attached and you entrust it to spiritual elders who will answer to God and to the laws of the land for their integrity or their lack of integrity. But you return it to the Lord and release it without strings or without designations. Tithing is a spiritual exercise of trust. So, secondly, what is a tithe? Simply put, it's 10%. And it's 10%. I always encourage people, people ask me, every time I speak about this, is it 10% of your gross or 10% of your net? And I always encourage, that's how I live, 10% of your growth. When I contribute to my RSP and it's a deduction from my check, that's a benefit that I get. Why wouldn't I tithe on a benefit that I get later on in life? When you pay your taxes, you, you, know, you get to drive on these beautiful roads. And, and uh, sorry, sorry, it's a little, little bit of a, sorry. Um, you, get, you get water, you get, electric, you get police and fire services. Those are all things that you benefit from. So there's good justification to look at your gross and say, God, I'm returning to you from this. Of your gifts and of inheritances and all those things, as if they're all a blessing from God, then we're able to say, thank you, God, for blessing me. I return what belongs to you. If you're a businessman, consider a tithe on your net profits on your business, not out of your operating costs, but be able to make God the partner in your business. And finally, where does the tithe go? I believe the tithe belongs in the local church. That's what the tr tradition and the custom of the first century church would have been. And your offerings can go to missions and parachurch organizations and social justice issues. You can do as God leads in your heart. But the tithe belongs to the church. And, and the principle in that, I believe, that's important is that you are releasing it without determining what it should be used for. That it's God's money. And you are also exercising trust in spiritual leadership, which is also a big issue when it comes to our giving. And so both of those exercises are powerful in our spiritual development. Let me try and, and uh, wrap this up. What are the benefits of, of giving and tithing to God? I want to testify that he stretches the 90% further than he can stretch further than the 100% will go without God's involvement. 
There have been seasons. My, my favorite story is, is uh, on this is is Jim Patterson, and uh, he's he's become a, a kind of a friend. I see him once a year, and and we talk. and And one time he said to me, "What are you preaching about?" Uh, he just turned ninety, by the way, and he's he's about this high. And uh, first time I met him was in the church. It was at a funeral. I'd never met him before. He's famous. He's a billionaire. And uh, we're in the, in the gym of the church at a funeral reception. He was all by himself. I went up. I introduced myself. He looked out. I said, I'm Brent Catalan. I'm a pastor here at the church. Yeah, nice church. What is your market share in this community? I'm like, what? Like he wanted to know what percentage of Langley attended my church. I, I said, you know, I don't, I don't have that number. He says, what's your annual budget and how, like, where were we at last year? I'm like, oh, was, yeah, fam, praise God, you know. Like, he wanted specifics. He thought that was, like, as a pastor, that should all be in my head. Maybe it should have been. But he, he's a, a little bit intimidating is all I'm trying to say. One time he said to me, what are you preaching about? I said, I'm, I'm talking about giving and tithing. He said, preach on that. People get sin. They get, understand salvation. They love the idea of heaven, but they don't get money. I thought, okay, well, you have a bit of cred here on this thing. He said, when I was a young man, I was making 5000 bucks a year selling used cars. And I've been raised to tithe, and I tithed faithfully, accurately, all the time. And then he said, I made some business deals, and all of a sudden, the next year, I made $50,000. And I thought to myself, and some of you have thought, whoa, that's a lot of money. And so I quit tithing, or I just sort of dropped it and gave here and there as I felt. And he said, you know, my finances just started going like this. And one time I was praying, I was asking God why that was happening, and he reminded me, you're not being faithful with what is mine. So what Jim Patterson did, he said, I went to the bank, and I borrowed all of my back tithes, plus the interest, and I repaid my tithe to the Lord. And he said, I've been tithing faithfully ever since, and I give missions over and above that. And if you have... A lot of capacity, then you need to talk to some people who have gone before you in this area. Guys, maybe you've set up foundations because some people, if you tithed out of your business, you could pay the whole church's budget annually, which is not healthy. Everybody needs to share the load together. So there are ways that you can still give and still honor God. But he said to me, you go ahead and tell them that it's because I believe in the tithe and the offerings that God has blessed me the way that he has. And he also said to me every night before I go to bed, I kneel down by my bed and I ask God to give me wisdom to steward the responsibility of dispersing the money that I'm entrusted with. So when you see Jim Pattison farm implements or you see Jim Pattison signs, you pray for that man, that he'd continue to be an example of what it means to honor God with your finances. Some of you, you haven't yet started into this. God can stretch the 90% and he has promised to pour out blessing. Let me give you the most famous verse in the Bible, Malachi chapter 3. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there will be enough food in my temple. And I will open, if you do, I will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Furthermore, God has promised to rebuke the devourer on your behalf so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. And John 10 says, the thief comes to steal, but I have come that you may have life and life abundantly. The tithe is returning what belongs to the Lord without control over it. It's only rendered ineffective when we withhold it. I want to just say two things quickly. First of all, there is a generation uh, that is very, very excited about social justice issues and giving to things that make us feel good. Our giving is not for us. So if I give to help sex slaves get free from captivity in Asia, I feel really good about that. And that's the truth, and that's a good mission. But there are some people that are falling into the trap of only giving to things that make you feel good. And at the end of the day, you're giving for your own benefit. You would never admit that. But there needs to be giving in our life that is simply for the acknowledgement that this isn't mine, it's God's, and this is his portion. And then give to missions, give to feed the poor, out of your offerings, but don't rob God of that which is his, and just make your giving for your own sake. Secondly, just to those who have a lot of capacity, to those, and you, God's blessed you, 
I just encourage you to talk to other people who are an example that you can follow. All right, let me give you, and, and, and I wanted to say somebody here, maybe you're disappointed because of some financial thing in the past. Maybe you're disappointed in the church. At one point, one of my staff members stole between fifty and $75,000 of cash that were coming in the offering. He was one of the counters. He had a plan. He would sift aside the cash. Well, there were people in our church who decided that they couldn't trust. And some of you, maybe you've had something that has caused your trust to waver. And you need to know that God wants to heal you of that and give you freedom from that wound. Because it is a wound. But it's not a reason to walk past the promises of Scripture. All right. Here's a, and, and the principle is that when you give to God, it's never lost. It's deposited in the bank of heaven, and he keeps the ledger, and there are rewards. And when you give it to the Lord, it's never lost, even if it seems like it gets diverted for a while. God will bless what you've given in the past. Okay, here's a story from a lady. I've been committed to going to church every Sunday for three years now. And uh, at first, I never tithed, and then after a year, I may have been giving it a little here and there, but God was working on my heart. It always felt overwhelming to me to give the big 10%. My husband is God's work in process, progress he would never understand, so her husband's not a believer. So I struggled and prayed about it. Every week, I got an allowance of $40, so I committed to tithe $5, small, but it was a start. Then in February, you had the Missions Faith Promise, and it, God laid it on my heart to do my $5 tithe and then $10 for missions. It was hard, but God was good. So that allowance was her operating fund for her household. I became pregnant with twins in March and went on sick leave. We didn't know how we were going to get by, but God had his own plans. God brought a couple into our life that has poured his blessing down us. They purchased everything we needed for our girls. They provided extra weekend work for my husband, and every six months they want a new list. Just last week, my twins were loaded down with toys. They have also talked to my husband about helping us buy a house. And this is just one example of how much help we have received. This couple are not Christians. And my husband thinks they are nice people trying to help us. But I know different. <laughs> God is able to take care of you. Are you willing to be a partner with him? These are spiritual principles that are about trust and about relationship. The test of our ability to handle wealth is, can God get it through us so that it multiplies, or does it end up in a bin? I want to just read one more story, and then I'm going to close. I know I'm over time already, but this, this is my favorite one. This guy's name is Josh. Hey, PB, just thought I'd share this with you. Hopefully you can pass it along. First, sincere from my heart, this church has been a blessing. The main reason I'm writing is to let you know what God has done in my life in this week. Well, I'm 23, and I've been a Christian since the age of 13, give or take. I had started to tithe on the little I received back then, but then I kind of stopped along the way. Anybody in here kind of stopped? That's, uh, yeah, I kind of stopped. I don't really know when, but kind of stopped. Then I heard a sermon on, on giving, and I remember him quoting the Bible about trying the Lord in such matters. Well, long story short, last Sunday, I tithed the first time after a long time, and this time I made sure I gave a tenth of my gross earnings, really wasn't doing that before. I love his ambiguity, really wasn't doing that. Like, he doesn't just say, I wasn't doing that before. I really wasn't doing that. I might have been, I don't think. And I took my offerings one step higher than I normally do. LOL. This was, you know, I love this. LOL. Two things happened. I don't usually check my mail because it's all bills and stuff. But on Monday, I did. I'm not really sure where I got a deposit of $120 into my account, but there it was. Here's the funny thing. My tithe and offering was exactly $120. After some evaluation on my student loan, I'm still in school, by the way, the National Student Loan Services saw fit to knock $950 off what I owe. Here's the funny part. Like, he's having a blast with this. I never applied for any reevaluation at any time. In fact, I thought the letter was some sort of, okay, dude, we need you to start paying up, LOL. Ha-ha! <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he was laughing out loud, literally. 
I think some sort of record was broken here. In one day flat, God held his word true. For all of you, then he, he preaches, for all of you who are still finding it hard to tithe, I feel you. I remember thinking how much I could get done with 120 before tithing it. But I did tithe it, and you know what? It's true. If you keep your hand firmly closed on what you've got, there is no way you are going to receive any more. That's good stuff, folks, from a 23-year-old guy who's walking in the supernatural in the realm of his finances. So let me say, if you want to break the fear of losing your money or not having enough, the way to break that fear is to begin to give to God. If money has become an idol and you see the love of money, the way to cast down that idol is to begin to give. If you have bitterness or hurt or broken relationships because of money, sow a peace offering and let God take care of that brokenness. If you're in financial need, the place out of that, go to the course that's being offered and start to give and honor God. If you're blessed, then give. If you're distant from God today, give. I know people who got saved after they started giving to God because it was such a stronghold in their life. I want you to stand up and I'm going to close. Thanks for letting me ramble so long. I know it was really long, boring and terrible stuff, but hopefully it's helping somebody here. I want you just to bow your heads and close your eyes, everybody. And I believe that in this realm... There are people in the room today and you need to make a step of faith, a beginning, a start. If you were honest before the Lord today, you would have to say, I haven't been living my life from the perspective that God is the owner of everything. You might also say, or someone else might say, I've not been seeing everything that I have as a blessing from God. And maybe maybe someone else would have to say honestly, I Pastor, I've been keeping the tithe, not returning it to the Lord. So for any one of you who are in one of those areas. If you're, if you're able to say, Lord, today I confess that everything belongs to you. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to lift your hand and we're going to pray together. If it's your desire to say, Lord, today I confess everything belongs to you. That hasn't been your perspective. I want to pray with you. If there's a person in the place and today you'd have to say, Lord Jesus, Today, I want to proclaim that everything I have is a blessing from you. And I want you to lift your hand in a minute. I want to pray with you. And if there's someone, and I know there should be many in this room, but I'm not going to separate you out. But there are some today, and you need to say before the Lord, today, I will begin or begin again to return the tithe and give offerings. Friends, Christian life is a spiritual matter that is evidenced by acts of obedience. We're not saved by our works, but the evidence of our faith is how we work. And there are some of you, many of you, and you need to begin. So, If you're that person saying, Lord, today I confess that everything belongs to you. That has not been your perspective, but you're willing for that to be your perspective. Or if you're a person who says, Lord Jesus, I want to live my life confessing that everything I have is a blessing from you. Or if you're that person saying, today I will begin or begin again to return the tithe. If you're one of those people, would you just lift your hand up? Because I want to pray for God to bless you in your finances. Go ahead, all over this room. You're saying, I I confess everything belongs to you, Lord. I confess that everything I have is a blessing from you. And today, I make a commitment that I will begin 
If it's you, just join these others. Many, many, many hands all over the room. And just join. Say, yeah, I'm, I'm part of that. I want to have that perspective in my finances. Just keep them up. Father, I just pray right now for spiritual breakthrough in this room, in the lives of people. Lord, as we acknowledge that you are source of everything that everything we have is a blessing from you and a trust and those who are saying i'm going to begin today i'm going to start a new practice i'm going to find a way to honor god and let him be my partner in this i just pray god that you will bless these people i ask you to pour out prosperity upon these people i ask you to bless them in their finances and to trust them with the true riches of heaven in jesus name I pray that this household would become a hub of generosity, a hub of life that brings life to kingdom initiatives. In Jesus' name, I pray. Then I want to pray for some in this room. You say, Pastor, I need a financial miracle. I've got crushing debt in my life. I need a breakthrough. I met a man in a mall who said to me, I'm, I'm in a three-day fast for a financial breakthrough. If you have an issue of finances, maybe in your marriage or you're afraid or a business deal that's gone south, you've got an actual financial need. I want to pray with you today before we go. So if you have that need, a financial need, you need a breakthrough, there's some blockage or some burden that you're bearing and you need a miracle today, I want you to lift up your hand right now. God, I pray for people in need of a miracle today. We know that you own all the resources and you are able to provide. I ask you for breakthrough. Lord, I ask you for closure on deals that have been lingering and not closing. I pray, God, for partnerships that would result in incredible synergy and growth. I pray pray for the release of debt. I pray for unforeseen blessings through inheritances and gifts and kindness. Lord, I pray that you will meet these needs for the glory of your name. And we will trust you and give you praise. And we ask it all in the name of Jesus. Would you agree with me this morning and say a good amen, everybody? Amen. If you'd like to begin today, you can go to the giving stations. There are many mechanisms for you to get started. God bless you. Thank you so much for letting me share one of the passions of my life, one of the visions to see the kingdom of God expand through generous people. God bless you. Thank you, Brad. Thanks. And H. Uh, our growth tracks are starting. There's a, well, I think around 20 people have already registered. If you are still wanting to jump into growth tracks, you haven't registered, that's cool. We have uh, muffins, we have fruit, we have coffee, we have tea. It's up, taught up, and it's going to be in the student center uh, with Pastor Jordan. You want to be there, you got time, an hour to give. You can go right up after this gathering and join us. We'd love to have you. In ancient times, the one who blessed extended his hands for a blessing. Those receiving a blessing did likewise. If you want a blessing today, here it is. May the eyes of your heart be open to all the blessings which surround you. May this awareness produce a harvest of generosity in your spirit. May thankfulness rise up within you, not just during this season, but day after day, from early morning until you retire for the night. And may your prayers reflect gratitude while also acknowledging the needs of others whose situations are so drastically different. So soul sanctuary. May the thoughts of Jesus fill your mind and the hunger for God drive your soul and the love for God guide your speech and your actions. And finally, may the grace, peace, and the love of the triune God protect defend and empower you to run with perseverance to the race that you are marked out for. Be blessed and we will see you next week.